And welcome everybody. This is Tom Judd of uh, IFMBE Clinical Engineering Division. Uh, I had the privilege of sharing as chair. Uh, this is our actually 21st webinar this year for CED. Uh, this was one that we didn't anticipate, but with the changes in COVID, you know, telehealth is the right topic. And in these uh, webinars this year, we've been uh, had registrants from over 114 countries, and we're very thankful to have that uh, influence. We do have an all-star lineup today, as you see. Uh, I'll introduce them as we go along. Um, certainly, the first couple, um, Dr. Coley, past uh, board chair of HIMSS, you know, representing health IT excellence around the world. Dr. Yung Kap Quankum, um, former e-health leader for WHO, is our first two uh, batters today. And like I say, I'll introduce others as we go. Now there's not been references so far provided, but we uh, not only the presentations today will be on our website, but we'll provide references as well that we think are key. We'll probably go an hour and a half today at least because we've got six uh, wonderful speakers and we'll have Q&A time and uh, put your input in through chat, but even better, your questions through the Q&A tab there at the bottom. Uh, we are also uh, recording on Facebook and uh, we'll give you a, a link for that for, the, for your colleagues. Uh, so the way we're going to start is after I finish here very quickly, uh, we'll have five minutes sort of overview of the disparities we're trying to address around the world with telehealth by Dr. Coley, and then he will jump into telehealth as a solution, and uh, Dr. Quankum will talk about the history of WHO's approach and the current views of telehealth, and then we'll get into others. And lastly, I'll say that October is a big month for uh, the CED because uh, a year from now, we'll have our next Congress in Orlando, Florida. We all believe we'll be able to be face-to-face, -face, even though we'll have a virtual component. And I'll send you a couple chats um, with blogs about all that. With that said, uh, Dr. Coley. Take it away. Thank you, Tom, and good morning, everyone. I'm truly delighted to be a part of this panel and, and share the stage with some uh, amazing individuals. So thank you uh, for having me this morning. Next slide, please. So just a little bit about me. I've be, just been very privileged to have had an opportunity to work with some impactful initiatives with some leading organizations globally with some amazing people and teams. And like all of us on the call, I share a passion for making healthcare better. And I'm currently serving as a senior advisor with the Albright Stonebridge Group. And I'm also leading uh, the Global Health uh, Initiative for Wings of Hope, a NGO based in the US and works globally. Next slide, please. So let me begin by sharing a personal story. Um, as a bright-eyed first-year medical student, I had a wonderful opportunity to spend my first um, uh, Christmas as a medical student uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. And we were to serve, serve a village of Guatemalan refugees. Um, and our mission was to really bring health and healing to this displaced community. And what I realized was that despite all our good intentions and the good work that we did, the interventions we did were self-limited and we did little to give the community health and healing beyond that two week period we were there. There was clearly an unmet need and an opportunity that could truly create something that would be empowering, sustainable, and scalable. Next click, please. So perhaps the most impactful thing we did in that mission, despite all the good work in, during the two weeks was leave this book with the villagers where there's no doctor the Spanish version of it. And as I was leaving uh, that, um, that trip, and as I've thought about what we did that period of time, that thought of sustainability and leaving something behind has stayed with me uh, through all the years. And I'll come back to this a little bit later in the presentation. Next slide, please. As I have engaged uh, in work globally, um, and all of you will probably appreciate that, we recognize that there are five common challenges that every economy, every country is facing. Safety and quality in care, access to timely care, the cost of care, workforce issues, maldistribution, inadequate resources, and the likes, and now recently burnout. And then ultimately the, the patient or the family or the consumer experience uh, as a result of healthcare. Next slide, please. 
So when we look at safety, clearly we have a lot of work to do. We have data from the WHO, from Johns Hopkins, from other sources, which clearly points that we are not performing well. One in 10 admissions leads to an adverse event globally. One in 300 admissions leads to death. 43 million people are injured worldwide due to unsafe medical care. And we really must address this. Next slide, please. Access to time and appropriate care. These are some pictures from a village mission in Colombia where patients have access to care perhaps once a month and they line up to see the doctors and the teams when they come in. Uh, we have similar stories we have seen in India and other geographies where there's such a dire need that we can, we can create a paradigm which can allow us to serve these patients much better in a much more equitable fashion. Next slide, please. We also have the same condition in developed countries. This is data from the US. We leave about 9% of our population uninsured. And data shows that uninsured adults are much more likely to go without needed medical care due to cost. So the access issue comes in multiple variety, but fundamentally the challenge we have globally is that our patients are not getting the care they need when they need it. Imagine going to a restaurant and ordering a meal and you're told that you have to come back a week later to get the meal. You would never go back to a restaurant. So, so really access to care becomes a very important uh, uh, intervention point. Next slide, please. And all of this at a cost of about 10% of the global GDP. So our bill for healthcare globally is about $8 trillion. And studies have shown that spending more doesn't necessarily lead you to better care. As you can see, the United States is a clear outlier. And as we'll see in the upcoming slides, we definitely have opportunities in the US healthcare system uh, to do better, despite all the money that's being spent here. Next slide, please. So when we look at life expectancy, when you compare the US to other similar countries, we have the lowest life expectancy. Child mortality is higher in the US than some of its peers. Next slide, please. And when we look at response to COVID, spending more doesn't necessarily mean that you're actually doing impactful things when it matters. When you look at this slide, it, the y-axis actually look, looks at the confirmed deaths per million people as of August 30th. And then the, the x-axis is actually the economic impact of economic policies and impact on economies. And you see that some of the countries that have been leaders, both in terms of mortality and economic uh, impact, uh, are nece not necessarily the most expensive countries in the world. Uh, Japan, Taiwan, Indonesia, Nigeria have been standouts uh, in terms of containing mortality as well as uh, uh, impact on the economy. Next slide, please. And when we start looking at workforce pictures, uh, the story is, is pretty clear. Now, I love the story on uh, the, the, the cartoon on the left side. It was drawn by a seven-year-old patient, a depiction of an office visit. And there's one thing that's wrong with this picture. That is that the doctor is smiling. And, and really, you know, when you, when you look at the experience that all the technology has created for consumers and patients in the U.S. and other developed countries, there's a lot of opportunity we see in terms of bringing the joy of medicine for physicians and bringing that patient experience back at the point of care. Similarly, this is a picture from India where you have a number of patients lining up to see one doctor. So these factors amongst others are leading to an increased rate of burnout. Next slide, please. So we have data that shows that uh, that physicians and nurses in, in some settings are working at about 50% productivity. So if we were to look at healthcare like a business, how do you begin to run a business at 50% productivity of your highest paid employee? And then data shows that about 30% of the resources in healthcare are really not aligned to the five axes that I spoke about earlier. So if 30% of 8 trillion could be repurposed to something that actually gives us better care 
safer care, timely care, cheaper care, that is the opportunity that I think this moment is presents in front of us. And ultimately, we all know that the pot of money is not grow going to grow significantly. Health ecosystems globally need to learn to do more with less. Next slide. Next. So the question I ask is, is there a more sustain sustainable way to deliver care? And, and as we look at how other industries have change how they run business, the answer is quite clear. Technology has matured to a level where I think we can come up with some very creative and novel solutions. And hence our discussion today on telehealth, remote patient monitoring. Now, food for thought, in low and middle income countries where there's still an undercapacity of hospital beds and the primary care networks perhaps are not very mature and the marginalized population essentially have access to no care, should we be talking about building an ecosystem that talks just about hospital beds? Or should we be talking about an ecosystem that incorporates virtual care, remote patient monitoring, artificial intelligence capabilities, along with you know, the traditional uh, spheres of care? Next slide, please. So let's look at some data, what's happening. As we look at data, you know, for the last 20 plus years, the number of hospital beds per, inhab per 1,000 inhabitants globally is decreasing. Next slide. But we're also seeing data, at least from the West, is that we are taking care of more patients with preventable diseases uh, in the hospital setting. Next slide, please. And even though the number of beds is decreasing, the cost of care in the hospitals has skyrocketed. In the US, the cost of hospital care has increased three and a half times almost, from 1.7% of, of the GDP in 1960s to almost 5.8% of the GDP uh, currently. Next slide, please. And that is pretty unsustainable. When you break down the hospital expenditure, a third of hospital costs in the US are attributed to hospital care. And when we start looking at, is there a better way we can manage risk? And if we can uh, uh, improve outcomes, the answer is quite clear. Next slide, please. So before COVID, we were seeing an incremental increase in adoption of telehealth. And the biggest barrier was not the, uh, not the availability of technology, but really policies and payment mechanisms that were uh, not in place. Next slide, please. And as we looked at COVID, and despite all the challenges that everybody has faced, it perhaps represents a tipping point for, health, uh, for telehealth, where all of a sudden government agencies and payers have begun to reimburse and, and uh, make it easier to, for patients and doctors to connect, to, uh, uh, to uh, connect with each other. Next slide, please. And as we look at the market for remote patient monitoring, it's expected to reach 31.3 billion by the end of 2023, up from near, uh, almost 16 billion in 2017. So we are clearly seeing the availability of technology and an openness, especially post COVID, to actually think about new ways of delivering care to patients globally. Next slide, please. Now, with technology comes another opportunity and a challenge. The growth in medical data is as much as 48% per year. And when you look at physicians and nurses as the front lines of care, and even uh, uh, public health agencies and executives who are looking to get insight from data, giving them large volumes of data at the point of decision-making is really not the solution. And we really need to be thinking about an inter integrated framework of technologies that actually allows us to capture data seamlessly, but also synthesize it perhaps using technologies like AI to deliver insights for better decision-making so that we can improve quality, improve safety, improve access to care and reduce cost of care while bringing the joy of medicine, uh, joy of practice back into medicine. Next slide, please. So currently we seem to be drowning in information and starting with wisdom. And I think this also creates an opportunity as we begin to think about how do we create ecosystem in the developing world to, to, uh, 
to reduce the disparities in the access to care and technology. Next slide, please. So as I think about this, you know, we need to work on multiple uh, levels. First of all, we need good policy aligned with strong incentives to really allow innovation to come to the forefront. And innovation is not simply de uh, developing new gadgets. It's actually innovation at all levels of care delivery and public health management. We really need to start focus, shifting our focus from data to insights. And, and as we start to look at uh, uh, containing costs and improving quality, we, will, we must start looking at inefficiencies that exist in our supply chain in healthcare. So the supply chain and the tools and equipment journey is very important for us to optimize and streamline so that we, we can begin to make the tools necessary for care delivery uh, where they're needed at a lowest cost. And then ultimately the, the, the patient journey and the provider journey are absolutely critical where we must design healthcare ecosystem that keep the needs of the patient and the consumer front and center. Healthcare ecosystem design with that end result in mind invariably will lead to an outcome that is unparalleled. Next slide, please. So as a primary care physician myself, you know, this is a, a classic picture and, and very romantic. And, and it sums up in one snapshot what we mean by bringing the joy of practice into medicine and what sustainability may look like. Where instead of a doctor's black bag, we're empowering community health workers and frontline physicians in every country with a smart device that can allow uh, them to connect with patients in their home. And not only with physical visits, but with remote visits. And that is the power and the promise of telehealth and remote patient monitoring. Next slide, please. So I want to give you an example that uh, uh, is very close to my heart. Remember I told a story earlier on that uh, I had gone uh, to the Yucatan Peninsula as a first year medical student. And um, uh, when we left, the only thing we left that I thought created a lot of value was, was a book uh, where there's no doctor. Now I have the privilege to serve um, uh, on the board of Wings of Hope, where I lead the global health programs. And we are uh, really focusing on how do we expand the mission to, uh, to change and save lives through power, of a, through power of aviation and extend it to other technologies. Next slide, please. So currently the Wings of Hope serves, directly serves about 67,000 patients annually. And we provide indirect assistance to approximately, approximately 1 million individuals globally. Next slide, please. We have missions in Tanzania where we fly a plane into uh, 25 different settlements and provide uh, medical care, vaccinations, emergency evacuation. And we've served, served about 40,000 patients in, in Tanzania in 2018. Next slide, please. And Zambia, same thing. There's an orthopedic surgeon and a plastic surgeon who help provide reconstructive surgery in Zambia. And this is the only uh, provider of these services in that country. Next slide, please. So we also have partnership with the Colombian Civil Air Patrol who run uh, 12 brigades annually. Next slide, please. And the work they do is, is very impressive. Once a month, they pick a village with a runway and they take 40 to 50 volunteer health professionals, 10 to 15 planes and pilots, and two tons of supplies and equipment. And uh, they set up a mini hospital to take care of uh, the populations. But as we talked to them about impact, they said, well, there's an unmet need. When we leave these villages, there's no follow-up care. And by the way, uh, you know, in pregnancy, if, if a woman uh, has a complication, the nearest hospital is 14 hour boat ride away. We can do better and we need your help in, in, in bringing telehealth and remote patient monitoring to these villages. Next slide, please. Two minutes, thanks. So, so amazing impact, but limited to once a year intervention at one of these 12 villages. Next slide, please. So Columbia came to the Wings of Hope and said, we want your help in getting telehealth, remote patient monitoring and drone program to augment our fixed wing program to impact health and well-being in these communities on a sustainable basis. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, 
so uh, uh, previous slide, please. Yeah, so essentially the, the whole conversation began with in, in, uh, expanding and enhancing the impact and using emerging technologies to actually serve patients better. Next slide, please. So, so the whole paradigm from going to a community that have a physical runway shifted to what can we do with a digital runway? And what we call is uh, the, 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 uh, the thick purple circle, the circle of hope. Within the circle are the partners in the developing world and the communities that they're serving. And Wings of Hope has now expanded its, its uh, mission to really start looking at how we link aviation technology with drone technology, remote patient monitoring, virtual care and artificial intelligence, and with global vol volunteerism to actually reduce this disparity to technology, health and care, to empower the communities and take care of uh, uh, patients locally in a sustainable manner. So the four values that, that really are driving uh, this model of care are sustainability, empowerment, stewardship, and scalability. Next slide, please. So as we look at how we begin to redesign healthcare globally, uh, th there are fundamental factors that, that, that exist uh, in many geographies. Leadership and vision absolutely is, is the key. We must begin with, with the end in mind. We must define what success looks like and work backward. Have public policy that actually is aligned with that and fund and, uh, and provide incentives for that right behavior, for the right change we're looking for. And ultimately, it's empowering the frontline uh, executives, workers, public health professionals to do the right thing so they can align people, processes, next slide, and next please and technology, information communication technology to really allow innovation to happen at the front lines. Ultimately, innovation is not something that we do. Innovation should be ingrained as part of our culture. And I think this is the Renaissance moment in healthcare where we have the technology, we have the awareness, we have the need. And if we come together and join hands and actually begin to leverage tools like telehealth and remote patient monitoring and artificial intelligence and align it with the need, we can actually create some amazing transformative models of care globally and impact lives for every citizen in the world. There's absolutely no reason that every human being on this planet should not have access to quality care when it's needed. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Manish, great work. Uh